question. It's raining. So clearly we're not in Bangalore. <laughs> we're in Melbourne, where I live now. And it's far more frequently raining than it is apparent here. And so this diagram says, if it is raining, then I get wet and I consider that undesirable. Does anyone have a problem with that? Yeah. Are there any assumptions? Yeah. Very good. Okay. So the diagram, it's, you're able to understand what the person means and channels the assumption. You did it very naturally. You looked at that and said, I don't think so. That conclusion does not follow. That just because it's raining, I get wet because I can be in here and looking outside. So, when you challenge the assumption, you uncover more information. So this diagram says, it's still a precondition. I can't stop it raining. But if I take this action that I go outside, and both of those things happen, so if it's raining and I go outside, then I get wet. That's a bit better. A bit better. Any more? There you go. Oh, I think we're going to go quick. You are kidding. Okay. If it's raining, and I go outside, and I forgot my umbrella, then I get wet. Okay? You get the idea. Okay? So, when anyone says something to you, such as, if you use Agile, everything will be fantastic. Right? <laughs> or, if you don't use Agile, you'll... Whatever bad things you say culturally, we say you'll go to hell. Right? So, then, what you should do is beware of naive assertions. This is what this tool can help you do. So, you go to this conference for three days, you get all excited about Agile, you learn all this stuff, your brain's exploding. And you go back to work and says, use Agile, everything will be fantastic! And your boss is going to look at you and go, I don't think so. <laughs> because people naturally can tell a naive assertion. But watch out. Don't say things like that. It's naive. The definition of Agile to say that. One of the things I think is a very important aspect of being agile is to be contextual, to be context specific. Your organization might, can't, cannot just go from A to B and suddenly go from not being agile to being agile. So beware of naive assertions, and it cuts both ways, and let's move on. A quick shout out to the tool that these diagrams are built with. As far as I know, it's the only tool specifically built uh, to draw these diagrams, but you can use Visio or anything, but it's called Flying Logic. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'll give you the download link for these slides at the end. So, what we just talked about, if-then diagrams, there's three types of those in the TOC thinking processes. I'm going to have to speed this up. Your organization, you map them out, and you work out the causes. And you uncover the assumptions, and you get to the real causes, and that's how you fix them. The future reality tree, is the opposite. You start with the desirable effects you'd like to see and then work out what needs to happen to cause that nice future reality. So you represent your current reality with its undesirable effects. You represent the future reality with its desirable effects. And then you create a transition tree to take you from A to B. And that would normally be something we'd spend two hours doing on a real example and we don't have time. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, there's another type which is a bit harder to understand, so I will uh, take you through some examples. And that is where, you know how I said the arrow means if then? Sometimes it means if not, then not, which just means without that, I can't have the other. So that's called necessary condition thinking, and I won't bother trying to explain that. We'll just get some examples going. So there's three types. You can see them there and download the slides. So. Here we go with an example. How to plan anything in one hour. So that includes world domination, the Agile India conference, your wedding, anything. Uh, hopefully you'll use it for, for making your businesses more productive. And that is called an intermediate objectives map. It has a very simple for that goal. And for each criti critical success factor, you have a network of necessary conditions. And we'll take an example. It'll make more sense. So let's say your goal is to run a great conference. So we've been uh, emailing uh, with Naresh, who, who organized this conference because we're sponsoring it. And 
you know, he's done a great job and it's really, really complex. So that you might not have had to organize a conference, but you can imagine how complex it is. So that's your goal. So you start with that. Then you say, what are the critical success factors that without, if we fail without all of them, if we don't have these, we're dead. So here's just a couple of examples. This is heavily simplified. But you have to provide a great program. A great, great program of speakers, a great amount of content. You'd probably all agree that for a conference to be successful, it needs to provide a great program. It also needs to provide a great experience for the attendees. Would we all agree? Okay. So that's just, there would be more than that, right? It has to not hemorrhage cash, right? It has to not kill the volunteer committee. You know, there's more, right? But a uh, simple example. Then, you keep working your way down. Now, it's, uh, so elements of creating a great experience. What are the necessary conditions for that to be true? Again, a simple example. Anything that must be true to have ticked off if provided a great experience. The attendees love the venue. That's something, that's a necessary condition of having a great experience. Would you agree? So this is a great venue. Do we all think it's a great venue? So we're happy. Our experience is good because this is a great place and food's great, service is great. We love the venue. This one's a bit harder. Attendees know what's going on all, at all times. It's a bit harder, but it's a necessary condition. When you've got 750 people who are all making their own way through the conference and trying to maximize the value, having them know what's going on at all times is a challenge. But there, there are two examples of conditions that are necessary to provide that great experience. You've also got uh, breaking down uh, a great program, providing a great program. What's true of that? Well, there's got to be something for everyone. So you can see in the design of the program for this conference, there's things for the introductory level, expert level, practicing level, on a whole different range of topics, people, leadership, all that vast number of tracks they've got for different levels. So they're, they're clearly demonstrating they want to provide something for everyone. And a good mix of uh, local and international speakers. So I think you'd agree that they've done that at this conference, and that's good. So planning this way is the key tip is to plan top down from the goal down, but to execute bottom up. And the question comes up always, when do you stop planning? And you stop planning when the things at the bottom look like things you can do, do or delegate. So these, these diagrams get more complex than this, clearly, but they map perfectly well to accountability for outcomes. So you designate someone to construct the great program. You designate someone to provide the great experience. So uh, it, it maps perfectly well. So top-down planning, bottom-up execution, reach any goal, including world domination. Good luck with that. So. Here's another great thing you can do with the thinking processes, which is resolve any conflict. That's a big claim, isn't it? But it's true. At least it's a technique to allow you to work out how to do it. Whether you can actually get the people to do it, different thing. So it's a type of thinking process called a, 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 a conflict resolution diagram. Uh, it used to be called an evaporating cloud. Uh, Dr. Goldratt, who invented it, considered what he was doing was making conflict disappear in a, in a puff of smoke. So I'll go through the structure with an example. So this is a semi-real example. Imagine uh, the people who run your company are considering an acquisition. So there's this company, XYZ, and some of the bosses want to buy it, and some of the bosses don't want to buy it. That's a conflict in the theory of constraint sense because it represents two states that cannot both exist. You cannot both buy the company and not buy the company. So that is a conflict. I'm not talking about a conflict where I push him in the pool and he sues me. Right? Two states of being that cannot both exist. So somebody has a want to buy the company. Someone has a want to not buy the company. So 
The trick is to work out why they want that. So let's say we do that. And then it's called working out what they actually need. So those who are lobbying to buy that company are wanting to maximize the growth of the business, which is a good thing. Those who want to not buy the company are trying to maintain product focus. That's a good thing too. So, Dr. Goldratt, who invented this, said something startling that I admit I still struggle with, but I haven't disproved it. So it's one of those, I'm still working on a common objective. So I'll just pause for a year or two while you process that. You <laughs> It'll take a while, it'll take a while. Just let it be. You can't have a conflict unless you have a common objective. So, because if you didn't have a common objective, you could just go your separate ways and do your own thing. You wouldn't have a conflict. That's the fundamental reason why. And I keep looking for examples where it's not true and haven't found them. So let's assume it's true for the moment until disproven. So. The next step is to work out what the common objective of the people with the conflict is. So in this simple example, they share the common objective to run a successful business. So the people involved in the conflict would probably both agree that running a successful business is a good thing and you need both to maximize growth and to maintain focus to do that. Both you need both of these to succeed. So we, what we're trying to do is make the conflict disappear without compromising what they need. We will have to compromise what they want. I don't know if you guys are, are familiar with the Rolling Stones, yeah? You can't always get what you want. Is that a song that you guys know? Yeah, yeah? You can't always get what you want, but you might get what you need, which is more important. So. Who can think of something that we could do? Let me ask the Java, have we got any Java programmers in the room? I'm a Java programmer, or used to be. They don't let me code anymore. Only a few, okay. Well, Java programmers tend to get this because uh, in, in Java you have a, the concept of an interface, you have it in other programming languages as well, and you might have a general purpose interface like a list, and then you have different implementations of that. So you have a linked list or a, an array list and some programmers work at the level of the interface and some tend to work at the level of the implementation and get wedded to their implementation. So what this is talking about is try, you have to unlock the hold that people have on their implementation. So the person lobbying for this wants to grow the business. That's what they want. That's what they need to grow the business. But their implementation of that at this moment that they're focused on is buying that company and that's all they can see. But we have to lift their eyes and say, that is one implementation of growing the business. There are an infinite number of alternate strategies for growing the business. So can anyone help these guys resolve this conflict? I've got a pre-canned one. But if you're in this situation, trying to resolve this conflict, what, what might you suggest? <laughs> buy company ABC. That would still violate no. keeping focus. No? Buy the company operating There you go. There you go. Maybe. Set up a separate division. Focus on that. That's one. There you go. That was kind of what I came up with. So I, I said you might establish, you know, a global reseller network. Maybe you're, you're, product, you're selling your product in one region. So you take that money and keep your product focus, but expand the number of customers you sell it to, as an example. So that's the basic way you resolve any conflict. Now, where it comes unstuck, when it, the rubber hits the road, is that people will not let go of their implementation. They've, they're focused and they want to buy that company and they've invested a lot in it, and you can't get them to let go of it, so you just have to shoot them. That was a joke. That was a, that was an Australian style joke, if it worked. So you don't shoot them. You try and get them to look at why they want to do it and why the other party wants to do what they want to do and work out how you can give them 
everybody what they need without compromising. It's not about getting one party to lose and the other to win. So you can try that at home to resolve the next conflict you come across. Yep. Uh, cases where people have different stakes all together in a conflict. So they come to a conflict because they have a different stake, they want uh, their pie out of it, and then there's nothing, no common object. So what's your example? A cavalry dam, you know, people want, uh, I remember the name of the dam, sorry. Okay, so a dam. People want it to be, you know, demolished because, because they think that they are common objective. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll ta let, me, let me just try and take that example. So you've already got a dam, and the debate is whether to get rid of it. Okay, I've never heard of that example. Fair <laughs> enough. Okay. In, in, Australia, in Australia, we debate about whether to build them or not. You guys <laughs> debate about whether to knock them down. Yep. Ah. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So you, I, I, that is a good example. You can't both knock it down and not knock it down. So that is a theory of constraints conflict. So... Why do the people want to knock it down? Okay, so there, what they want is the people to be safe, right? Yeah, and what do the people who want to keep it? What is it? Because of the dam, there's water supply. You know, there's enough water supply for some other region. There's a regional flag where somebody's getting the water out of it, but the dam is in a different area altogether. Because the people where the dam is has an interest. Yep. No, no, it can, it can, it can. I'm not sure that in the two minutes we have left, but I'm very... <laughs> Their common objective, this is similar to Israel, Palestine, and all those sorts of things. The common, the common objective, from, from someone who's not an Israeli or a Palestinian, it's when you look at that conflict, those two peoples are very, very similar. They have very, very strong traditions, very strong family values, and their common objective is to have a good life with their families. That's the common objective. They all want that. And one person having that doesn't stop someone else having it. They are wedded to their implementation of that. That's the problem. And the only way to resolve it is to get to alternate implementations of that. So, but there is a common objective. Sorry. I don't, I don't know whether the people there would say it, but they stopped bombing each other. Yeah. <laughs> Was it resolved? I don't, there you go. Yeah, so I have no view on that. I have no view. But very happy to, you know, you can have really great conversations about this stuff. And uh, I'm just the messenger, don't shoot me. If, if, if you don't like it, I didn't make it up. So what can you do with this agile thinking, these real tools? You can examine the root cause of your problems with the current reality tree and the undesirable effects and what's causing it. You can plot a course to a better future by imagining the positive desirable effects you want uh, and working out what needs to be true to cause that and uncover the assumptions that people have that are incorrect when you're doing the planning. You can plan very quickly and thoroughly. I can't emphasize the thoroughly enough. When you plan top down from a goal and ask all the stakeholders what's critical to them, there's some people who are always about the money, and there's some people who are always about the time, and there's some people who are always about the features. And if you plan holistically, uh, you'll get a better result, and you can resolve conflicts without compromise, at least in theory. So uh, we're hiring, we're agile, we're cool, we're cool. aconnects.com slash India, come and work for us. There you go, Jimmy Joe 68, unless you didn't like it, Martin Fowler. And you can download this from a very simple URL, tinyurl.com slash agile thinking. Okay, so we're out of time. I have to run the test. Who knows more about TOC thinking processes than they did half an hour ago? Okay, tick. Uh, who thinks they might actually be able to derive something useful from the last half an hour they invested? Excellent. Who enjoyed themselves? That's my definition of done. Thank you very much.